Hesychasm is a mystical tradition of prayer in the Eastern Orthodox Church by the Hesychast, based on Christ's injunction in the Gospel of Matthew that, When thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray. Hesychasm in tradition has been the process of retiring inward by ceasing to register the senses, in order to achieve an experiential knowledge of God, meanings of the term. Callistos where distinguishes five distinct meanings of the term, has each asm, solitary life, a sense, equivalent to, eremitical life, in which the term is used since the 4th century. The practice of inner prayer, aiming at union with God on a level beyond images, concepts and language, a sense in which the term is found in Evagrius Ponticus, Maximus the Confessor, and Simeon the New Theologian. The quest for such union through the Jesus prayer, the earliest reference to which is in Diadochos of Photiki, the theology of Saint Gregory Palamas, on which see Palamism, history of the term, the origin of the term Hesychasmos, and of the related terms Hesychastes, Hesychia and Hesychazo, is not entirely certain. According to the entries in Lamp's apatristic Greek lexicon, the basic terms Hesychia and Hesychazo appear as early as the 4th century in such fathers as St. John Chrysostom and the Cappadocians. The terms also appear in the same period in Evagrius Ponticos, who although he is writing in Egypt is out of the circle of the Cappadocians, and in the sayings of the Desert Fathers. The term Hesychast is used sparingly in Christian ascetical writings emanating from Egypt from the 4th century on, although the writings of Evagrius and the sayings of the Desert Fathers do attest to it. In Egypt, the terms more often used are Anchoritism and Anchorite. The term Hesychast was used in the 6th century in Palestine in the lives of Cyril of Scythopolis, many of which lives treat of Hesychasts who were contemporaries of Cyril. Here, it should be noted that several of the saints about whom Cyril was writing, especially Euthymios and Savas, were in fact from Cappadocia. The laws of the Emperor Justinian I treat Hesychast and Anchorite as synonyms, making them interchangeable terms. The terms Hesychia and Hesychast are used quite systematically in the Ladder of Divine Ascent of St. John of Sinai and in Prose Theodolin by St. Hesychios who is ordinarily also considered to be of the school of Sinai. It is not known where either St. John of Sinai or St. Hesychios were born, nor where they received their monastic formation. It appears that the particularity of the term Hesychast has to do with the integration of the continual repetition of the Jesus prayer into the practices of mental ascesis that were already used by hermits in Egypt. Hesychasm itself is not recorded in Lamp's lexicon, which indicates that it is a later usage, and the term Jesus prayer is not found in any of the fathers of the church. St. John Cassian presents as the formula used in Egypt for repetitive prayer, not the Jesus prayer, but, O oh God, make speed to save me, O oh Lord, make haste to help me. By the 14th century, however, on Mount Athos the terms hesychasm and hesychast refer to practice and to the practitioner of a method of mental ascesis that involves the use of the Jesus prayer assisted by certain psychophysical techniques. Most likely, the rise of the term hesychasm reflects the coming to the fore of this practice as something concrete and specific that can be discussed. Books used by the hesychast include the Philokalia, a collection of texts on prayer and solitary mental ascesis written from the 4th to the 15th centuries, which exists in a number of independent redactions, the Ladder of Divine Ascent, the collected works of St. Simeon the New Theologian, and the works of St. Isaac the Syrian, as they were selected and translated into Greek at the monastery of St. Savas near Jerusalem about the 10th century. Hesychastic practice Hesychasts are fully integrated into the liturgical and sacramental life of the Orthodox Church, including the daily cycle of liturgical prayer of the Divine Office and the Divine Liturgy. 
However, Hezi chasts who are living as hermits might have a very rare attendance at the Divine Liturgy and might not recite the Divine Office except by means of the Jesus Prayer. In general, the Hezi chast restricts his external activities for the sake of his Hezi chastic practice. Hezi chastic practice involves acquiring an inner focus and blocking of the physical senses. In this, Hezi chasm shows its roots in Evagrius Ponticus and even in the Greek tradition of asceticism going back to Plato. The Hezi chast interprets Christ's injunction in the Gospel of Matthew to go into your closet to pray, to mean that one should ignore the senses and withdraw inward. St. John of Sinai writes, Hesychasm is the enclosing of the bodiless primary cognitive faculty of the soul in the bodily house of the body. In step 27, 21 of the ladder, St. John of Sinai describes Hesychast practice as follows. Take up your seat on a high place and watch, if only you know how, and then you will see in what manner, when, whence, how many and what kind of thieves come to enter and steal your clusters of grapes. When the watchman grows weary, he stands up and prays, and then he sits down again and courageously takes up his former task. In this passage, St. John of Sinai says that the primary task of the Hezi chast is to engage in mental assesis. This mental assesis is the rejection of tempting thoughts that come to the Hezi chast as he watches in sober attention in his hermitage. Much of the literature of Hesychasm is occupied with the psychological analysis of such tempting thoughts. This psychological analysis owes much to the ascetical works of Evagrius Ponticos, with its doctrine of the eight passions. Saint John Cassian is not represented in the Philokalia except by two brief extracts, but this is most likely due to his having written in Latin. His works represent a transmittal of Evagrius Pontico's ascetical doctrines to the West. These works formed the basis of much of the spirituality of the Order of St. Benedict and its offshoots. Hence, the tradition of St. John Cassian in the West concerning the spiritual practice of the hermit can be considered to be a tradition parallel to that of Hesychasm in the Orthodox Church. The highest goal of the Hezi Chast is the experiential knowledge of God. In the 14th century, the possibility of this experiential knowledge of God was challenged by a Calabrian monk, Balaam, who although he was formerly a member of the Orthodox Church had been trained in Western scholastic theology. Balaam asserted that our knowledge of God can only be propositional. The practice of the Hezi Chasts was defended by Saint Gregory Palamas. In solitude and retirement, the Hesychast repeats the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. The sinner, the Hesychast prays the Jesus prayer, with the heart, with meaning, with intent, for real. He never treats the Jesus prayer as a string of syllables whose surface or overt verbal meaning is secondary or unimportant. He considers bare repetition of the Jesus prayer as a mere string of syllables, perhaps with her mystical inner meaning beyond the overt verbal meaning, to be worthless or even dangerous. This emphasis on the actual, real invocation of Jesus Christ mirrors an Eastern understanding of mantra in that physical action, voice and meaning are utterly inseparable. There is a very great emphasis on humility in the practice of the Jesus prayer. Great cautions being given in the texts about the disaster that will befall the would-be Hezi chast if he proceeds in pride, arrogance or conceit. It is also assumed in the Hezi chast texts that the Hezi chast is a member of the Orthodox Church in good standing, while he maintains his practice of the Jesus prayer, which becomes automatic and continues 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. The Hezi chast cultivates watchful attention. Sobriety contributes to this mental ascesis described above that rejects tempting thoughts. It puts a great emphasis on focus and attention. The Hezi chast is to pay extreme attention to the consciousness of his inner world and to the words of the Jesus prayer, not letting his mind wander in any way at all. The Hezi chast is to attach eros, that is, yearning, to his practice of sobriety so as to overcome the temptation to acedia. 
He is also to use an extremely directed and controlled anger against the tempting thoughts. Although to obliterate them entirely he is to invoke Jesus Christ via the Jesus prayer. The Hezi Chast is to bring his mind into his heart so as to practice both the Jesus prayer and sobriety with his mind in his heart. The descent of the mind into the heart is taken quite literally by the practitioners of Hezi Chasm and is not at all considered to be a metaphorical expression. Some of the psychophysical techniques described in the texts are to assist the descent of the mind into the heart at those times that only with difficulty it descends on its own. The goal at this stage is a practice of the Jesus prayer with the mind in the heart, which practice is free of images. What this means is that by the exercise of sobriety, the Hesychast arrives at a continual practice of the Jesus prayer with his mind in his heart and where his consciousness is no longer encumbered by the spontaneous inception of images. His mind has a certain stillness and emptiness that is punctuated only by the eternal repetition of the Jesus prayer. This stage is called the guard of the mind. This is a very advanced stage of ascetical and spiritual practice, and attempting to accomplish this prematurely, especially with psychophysical techniques, can cause very serious spiritual and emotional harm to the would-be hezi chast. Saint Theophan the Recluse once remarked that bodily postures and breathing techniques were virtually forbidden in his youth, since... Instead of gaining the Spirit of God, people succeeded only in ruining their lungs. The guard of the mind is the practical goal of the Hezi Chast. It is the condition in which he remains as a matter of course throughout his day, every day until he dies. It is from the guard of the mind that he is raised to contemplation by the grace of God. The Hezi Chast usually experiences the contemplation of God as light, the uncreated light of the theology of St. Gregory Palamas. The Hezi Chast, when he has by the mercy of God been granted such an experience, does not remain in that experience for a very long time. Written by St. Philotheos Kokinos, but he returns to earth and continues to practice the guard of the mind. The uncreated light that the Hesychast experiences is identified with the Holy Spirit. Experiences of the uncreated light are allied to the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. Notable accounts of encounters with the Holy Spirit in this fashion are found in St. Simeon the New Theologian's account of the illumination of George in the conversation with Motovilov in the life of St. Seraphim of Sarov and, more recently, in the reminiscences of Elder Porphyrios. Orthodox tradition warns against seeking ecstasy as an end in itself. Hesychasm is a traditional complex of ascetical practices embedded in the doctrine and practice of the Orthodox Church and intended to purify the member of the Orthodox Church and to make him ready for an encounter with God that comes to him when and if God wants. Through God's grace, the goal is to acquire, through purification and grace, the Holy Spirit and salvation. Any ecstatic states or other unusual phenomena which may occur in the course of Hezi Chas practice are considered secondary and unimportant, even quite dangerous. Moreover, seeking after unusual, spiritual, experiences can itself cause great harm, ruining the soul and the mind of the seeker. Such a seeking after, spiritual, experiences can lead to spiritual delusion, the antonym of sobriety, in which a person believes himself or herself to, be a saint, has hallucinations in which he or she, sees angels, Christ, etc. This state of spiritual delusion is in a superficial, egotistical way pleasurable, but can lead to madness and suicide, and, according to the Hesychast Fathers, makes salvation impossible. Mount Athos is a center of the practice of Hesychasm. St. Pisius Velichkovsky and his disciples made the practice known in Russia and Romania, although Hesychasm was already previously known in Russia, as is attested by St. Seraphim of Sarov's independent practice of it. Hesychas Controversy About the year 1337, Hesychasm attracted the attention of a learned member of the Orthodox Church, Barlam, a Calabrian monk who at that time held the office of abbot in the monastery of St. Saviour in Constantinople and who visited Mount Athos. 
Mount Athos was then at the height of its fame and influence. Under the reign of Andronicus III Paleologus and under the leadership of the Protus Simeon, on Mount Athos, Balaam encountered Hesychasts and heard descriptions of their practices. Also reading the writings of the teacher in Hesychasm of St. Gregory Palamas, himself an Athenite monk, trained in Western scholastic theology, Balaam was scandalized by Hesychasm and began to combat it both orally and in his writings. As a private teacher of theology in the Western scholastic mode, Balaam propounded a more intellectual and propositional approach to the knowledge of God than the Hesychasts taught. Balaam took exception to the doctrine entertained by the Hesychasts as to the nature of the light, the experience of which was said to be the goal of Hesychast practice, regarding it as heretical and blasphemous. It was maintained by the Hesychasts to be of divine origin and to be identical to the light which had been manifested to Jesus a disciples on Mount Tabor at the Transfiguration. This Balaam held to be polytheistic, inasmuch as it postulated two eternal substances, a visible and an invisible God. On the Hesychast side, the controversy was taken up by St. Gregory Palamas, afterwards Archbishop of Thessalonica, who was asked by his fellow monks on Mount Athos to defend Hesychasm from the attacks of Balaam. St. Gregory himself was well educated in Greek philosophy. St. Gregory defended Hesychasm in the 1340s at three different synods in Constantinople, and he also wrote a number of works in its defense. In these works, St. Gregory Palamas uses a distinction, already found in the 4th century in the works of the Cappadocian Fathers, between the energies or operations of God and the essence of God. St. Gregory taught that the energies or operations of God were uncreated. He taught that the essence of God can never be known by his creature even in the next life, but that his uncreated energies or operations can be known both in this life and in the next, and convey to the hesychast in this life and to the righteous in the next life a true spiritual knowledge of God. In Palamite theology, it is the uncreated energies of God that illumine the hesychast who has been vouchsafed an experience of the uncreated light. In 1341, the dispute came before a synod held at Constantinople, and presided over by the Emperor Andronicus III, the synod, taking into account the regard in which the writings of the Pseudo-Dionysius were held, condemned Balamlam, who recanted and returned to Calabria, afterwards becoming bishop in the Roman Catholic Church. One of Balaam's friends, Gregory Akin Dinos, who originally was also a friend of St. Gregory Palamas, took up the controversy, which also played a role in the civil war between the supporters of John Cantacuinus and John V Paleologus. Three other synods on the subject were held, at the second of which the followers of Balaam gained a brief victory. But in 1351 at a synod under the presidency of the Emperor John VI Cantacuinus, Hesychast doctrine was established as the doctrine of the Orthodox Church.